In this episode of Sea Power, we take to the air of the oceans for a bird's eye view of the battlefield. The first use of aircraft by navies was limited and mostly of reconnaissance roles. As aircraft developed, it became clear that the aeroplane would become an integral weapon of the modern navy. This is the story of the most successful early aircraft that paved the way for the development of today's most deadly eyes in the sky. The Lockheed P-3C Orion is a fearless airborne hunter. Its reputation as the ultimate submarine finder was achieved through more than 35 years of service. From the Cuban Missile Crisis to round-the-clock low-profile patrols throughout the Cold War. Today, the P-3 is still very busy as it is remarkably well adapted for maritime patrol in the post-Cold War world. The P-3 can be outfitted with a variety of sophisticated detection equipment. It is one of the most modern eyes in the sky. Infrared and long-range electro-optical cameras, plus special imaging radar, allow it to monitor activity from a comfortable distance, allowing its crew to pick the most opportune time to strike. Often, the Orion will just observe and direct naval counterparts in the strike attack phase of a naval conflict. It can stay aloft for extremely long periods, and its four powerful Allison T 56 A 14 engines can fly at almost any altitude. These attributes with the aim of the earliest eyes in the sky, the Zeppelins. Airships took to the skies around 1900. Very quickly, the military saw the merit in the Zeppelin. It was the first viable method of navies to view beyond the horizon. Even so, they were cumbersome and limited. The naval fleet that had the advantage of peering over the horizon could evaluate an opponent's strength and manoeuvre itself into the most favourable position before battle began. The United States Navy was also inspired and went on to build the Shenandoah, Akron and the Macon. The airships served the Navy well, but their time was running out as advancements in airplanes was being gained at a quickening pace. Unfortunately, many regard the airship as ineffective. Perhaps newspaper images depicting wrecks and fireballs such as these of the Shenandoah fueled such scepticism. But navies use these lighter-than-air giants with a reasonable degree of success. However, the moment planes became reliable, the airship's days were numbered as they were easy targets for the faster and more manoeuvrable biplanes. Interestingly, the airships of yesteryear are still the largest craft we have flown. The British counterpart of the Lockheed Orion is the Nimrod which entered service in 1969. Based on the Comet 4, the Nimrod was, as it remains today, the only jet-powered long-range maritime patrol aircraft in military service. Offering the advantages of speed and height in transit, while still capable of long on-task periods, and in particular, stealth, in the anti-submarine warfare role. As most propeller engine maritime patrol aircraft make a discrete resonance that is easily detectable by submerged submarines, the Nimrod with jet engines and associated jet noise is virtually undetectable. In the early 1980s, 
the aircraft was upgraded to MR2 standard. Although the Nimrod MR2 airframe is aging, it still remains a potent and respected maritime patrol aircraft. It has served with distinction in the Falklands conflict, the Gulf War, and in support of the maritime blockade of the Balkans during the Bosnia crisis. The Nimrod MR2 will continue in service until all squadrons have been re-equipped with the Nimrod MRA4. The Nimrod Bombay carries the Stingray torpedo and the Harpoon missile for the anti-surface unit warfare role. The Orion is also equipped with the menacing harpoon. During the 1990s, improvements mainly directed towards the provision of advanced signal processing capabilities, the Orions were implemented to meet the threat of new generation fast, quiet and deep diving submarines. November 2003 saw international upgrades include new electronic support measures, radar and acoustic sensors, new data management system and new communication suite. The aircraft is flown by a crew of 10 on missions up to 14 hours long. The flight deck accommodates the pilot, the co-pilot and the flight engineer. The P-3C has advanced submarine detection sensors, such as directional frequency and ranging, sonar buoys and magnetic anomaly detection equipment. The airborne electronic surveillance receiver is carried on a pylon under the wing fairing. The system automatically operates in search mode, its target primarily being submarine radars. The aircraft can carry weapons in the Bombay and on 10 underwing pylons. The Bombay is in the underside of the fuselage forward the wing. It is capable of carrying a 2,000 pound mine or alternative ordnance, including 1,000 pound mines, depth bombs, torpedoes or nuclear depth bombs. Its underwing pylons can carry 2,000 pound mines, torpedoes, rockets, rocket pods and 500 pound mines. The US Navy P-3C aircraft are equipped to carry the Harpoon AGM-84 anti-ship and standoff land attack missile. The P-3C still remains the most up-to-date version of the P-3 Orion. A successor aircraft from Lockheed was planned during the early 1980s, which would have been designated the P-7. However, a lack of funding for this project caused it to be cancelled in 1989. Thus, the P-3 Orion will probably continue on as the US Navy's premier anti-submarine warfare and maritime patrol aircraft through the first decades of the 21st century. To this end, Lockheed are currently assessing the fatigue life and damage tolerance characteristics of the P-3C airframe, identifying any structural modifications required in an effort to attain the 2015 service life goal the Navy has requested. With capabilities like these, it is no wonder that somewhere above the Earth during peace or conflict, there is nearly always an Orion, serving as an eye in the sky. One of the most highly regarded eyes in the sky was the Catalina series of aircraft that dogged the Nazi submarine fleet. These planes were among the earliest real threats to the Kriegmarine. Marine. 
As early as World War I, the flying boat was used to hunt down and kill its natural prey, submarines. Although the seaplanes didn't destroy many U-boats, it did make it more difficult for the U-boats to get close to the merchant ships. Just the presence of the flying boats was a deterrent that the U-boat captains took seriously. Towards the end of the First World War, there were a small number of reported U-boat sinkings by these early seaplanes that were rapidly becoming improved. This was the first time that submarines had a capable opponent. This threat from the air remains today. With the outbreak of World War II, Britain requested a vast number and variety of aircraft. Of all the aircraft, it was the Catalina that would be the prominent plane that would play a major role in keeping the sea lanes open for the delivery of the much needed wartime supplies. PBY squadrons operated from bases in the North Atlantic and provided air coverage for the convoys. The Catalina's 4,000 mile range permitted the aircraft to provide reasonably effective but not total coverage. Many times, the sea lanes were almost closed by the stealth tactics of the German U-boats. It was the Catalina that was the first Allied weapon to turn the tide. In the North Atlantic, the British PBY carried the ACY aircraft to surface vessel anti-submarine radar. This new technology was used together with visual observation. On sighting the prey, a PBY crew would launch and attack with bombs and depth charges. The Catalina was in essence an early 1930s design and although it was used in many theatres of war, it was already showing its age when compared to new designed aircraft. However, it was so good at its roles it was given, that even its outdated performance still couldn't hold back the Catalina from going on to become a legend. The Catalina fell short in many areas. For example, its top speed was less than many of the cars of that day. Its age is also evident in the laborious task of preparing a Catalina for a mission. More modern craft had better and quicker methods of flight preparation. The Catalina was a hands-on job. In the Pacific region, isolated squadrons relied on mechanics to recycle parts manufacture parts, and above all, be creative to keep the planes airborne. With the most basic tools, the mechanics were able to keep this simple machine in the air. Bullet holes were fixed with tin snips and a rivet gun. In the Pacific, the Catalinas flew secret missions and were painted black. They became known as the Black Cats. They carried bombs, death charges and torpedoes. They only had a couple of 50 caliber machine guns for defence and this was no match for the gunnery of the Japanese fighters that they often encountered. They most often worked alone and the only cover they had was the black paint that helped camouflage them in the night sky. The Black Cat's crews left at dusk and their flights extended well into the night. At that time, there wasn't any such thing as global positioning and night flying gave them little opportunity to navigate by visual means. Their main means of navigation was the stars. The crews mostly flew blind. 
although nearly invisible to the eye, the engine noise often alerted the enemy to the presence of the black cats. And if they were lucky, the cats would be able to strike first and withdraw in success before the enemy could get into full swing. The old cat leader was very susceptible and its age was a real barrier to any performance fly. However, with black paint and the ability to skim the ocean, it provided a cat and mouse game of detection. Boeing, Vickers and the Naval Air Factory also built them under license. The United States Navy employed over 3,000 of the Catalina. Other Commonwealth nations, including Britain and the Dutch, also utilised the outstanding services that the Catalina would provide. The distinguishing feature of the Model 5 is the bubble-type blister on the fuselage. This was used as a gun turret the blister was also very useful in another role, that of sea rescues. The Catalina was both a success in battle actions and commercial applications. It was not in any way an outstanding performance craft, but it was outstanding in simplicity. There are very few black cats left in the world and the Historical Aircraft Restoration Society has restored this example. The aircraft was purchased in 2002 in Portugal where it had been operated as a water bomber under Chilean registration and was flown to Australia in September 2003. The aircraft is a PBY 6A model which is very similar to the more common PBY-5. It is an amphibious model where the black cats were seaplanes. The choice of amphibian was made when purchasing the aircraft on the basis of convenience. As its role today is to visit as many air shows as possible so that people can view this remarkable plane. Today, people are educated on the role of the aircraft and the airmen of the Royal Australian Air Force who gallantly flew them under the cover of darkness from remote Pacific locations. In all, 239 Australian pilots lost their lives flying top secret and near suicide missions to keep the Pacific Ocean open. In all, the RAAF had a total of 166 Catalina aircraft. As this aircraft was left in storage for 20 years, a team from the Historical Aircraft Restoration Society flew to Portugal to get the craft into airworthy condition. After much work, the plane was ready for the long haul to Australia. One of the final stages of the preparation was the testing of the plane's engines, and this was achieved by running the aircraft up and down the runway. Once satisfied with the plane's mechanical and airframe condition, it was flown for the first time in over 20 years. Flight plans were then made to bring the Catalina to its new Australian home. Its first stop was to be England. However, a devastating hydraulic fluid leak occurred and the PBY was forced to land in France. The crew ran checks and got the main landing gear down. But the front gear didn't lower. It had to be manually lowered. The next problem had to be overcome. The plane had lost its brakes. To compound the problem, the provincial airfield had a very short runway. The landing didn't go well and the main portside landing gear failed and the PBY's hopes of reaching Australia on schedule were dashed.
This heartbreaking event is typical of the hurdles that face any organisation that embarks on restoring such relics. Fortunately, the Catalina was not extensively damaged and the Historical Aircraft Restoration Society returned at a later date and repaired the PBY. The rest of the story is history, as today, this magnificent example of restoration is now fulfilling its role of proudly flying before the crowds as both a tribute to the aircraft and those brave aviators of the Black Cat Squads.